It's good to see all of you here this morning, and I'm glad that you made it uh, and in person, as well as those of you who are joining us online. We're delighted that you've chosen to worship with us today, and we'd like to make a couple of announcements. Um, one has to do with the Super Bowl, not the one tonight. The one today, you probably noticed a big pot on the lectern, and Ryan is going to say more about that during the ministry moment. Um, and would ask that you pay attention to the announcements that are on the back of your bulletin. Uh, take note of those items that uh, appeal to you or apply to you. And so, thank you for doing that. I took our call to worship from Psalm 1, which says, Let us delight on the law of God and meditate on God's teachings day and night. And the psalmist goes on to say that those who delight in the law of God and who meditate on God's teachings day and night are like trees planted by streams of water. And so may we today be open to God's words, that we meditate on God's teaching, that we may too be nourished like trees by the stream. Please stand together with us as we uh, begin our worship, and uh, we as, as Bible-believing Christians, we, uh, we recognize that God is one in essence and yet three in persons, and uh, our opening song, Holy Spirit, we are asking for the Spirit's presence among us to attend uh, us in worship, and uh, He is not an impersonal force uh, like the force from Star Wars, but He is in fact the third person of the Godhead, Holy Spirit.
can be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Excited to be able to be here this morning to one, just to be back. Um, for those of you that don't know, when we, on our way home from Universal, we found a couple other souvenirs on the bus that we did not intend to bring. Um, but everyone's back, everyone's healthy again, um, so, so we're, all, we're all glad to be back and be ready. Uh, but this morning, um, it's Super Bowl Sunday, uh, and that's with an S-O-U-P-E-R. Um, so what that is, is we participate in the Super Bowl of Caring. It's a, at this point, it's a global ministry that actually started right here in Columbia um, years ago. I, could, I couldn't tell you when it actually started. And, and Ashton has been participating in this ministry since well before my time. I'm just carrying it on with, with the youth that we have today. Um, but it's a, it's a ministry that once a year has a has a one day drive to to raise money for local missions and, and, and charities. Um, so this year, uh, and we've done it in the past, is we raised money for for Epworth. Um, so we're going to continue to raise money for Epworth with this with it this year. But in addition to that, we're also going to raise money to for our own blessing box to. To purchase supplies for it, so so our the the funds we raise today will be going two places this year. Um, so, with that being said, it's easy to to donate. You can dump out your purse or your wallet in the big silver bucket in the back. Uh, whatever falls in it, we can use. Uh, you can you can write it. You can write a check, loose change. Uh, if you don't have anything but would like to make a don donation. I believe Karen has, on, on the online giving, I think she has made a tab for, for Super Bowl of Karen if you would like to, to give online as, as well. Um, if you don't have money today but would like to give, you can, you can send, send money in this week. Uh, all checks can be made to, to Ashland um, with a note for Super Bowl of Karen on, on the memo line um, and then some point in the next week or, or so, Karen will cut one check to Epworth for, for the money that is raised for them. Um, at the end of service, you can find some of these lovely faces out here that are, I'm looking at half of them right now, the, the youth and children. Um, they will be happy to collect money from you and put it in the bucket. Um, the youth will also come around during Sunday school hour with, with the bucket to talk a little bit about it as, as well. So. Um, that, that's all I have this morning, so thank you very much, and, and we appreciate all your support for, for MYF and for Super Bowl of Caring. Thank you, Ron. He, he, he failed to mention that we take IOUs, too. You just <laughs> sign those and put them in, and uh, we'll track you down. The Super Bowl Sunday is an example of our of your faith in action, which happens to be the title of a book written by John Culp. Many of you know John Culp. He, the driving force behind the Salkahatchee Summer Service, and this book. It's kind of his recollections over his many years of being involved in that. And uh, he's going to be with us at the 11 o'clock service, and he may be around during the Sunday school hour. So but I think many, if not most of you, uh, know John. And he's been a good friend of mine uh, ever since I uh, came into the South Carolina Conference <coughs> a, a long time ago. So, hope you'll take advantage of it. I think there will be copies of this book uh, for sale. So just, if you see a tall guy out hawking this book, that's John Culp. He'll, he'll be around. As we come to that 
point in our service where we join together in prayer, there's a lot to be in prayer for today. Continue to be in prayer for Scott and Amy and their family. Uh, some of you may have heard by now that Amy's father has suffered a stroke. Uh, he's in critical condition. They are, Scott and, and Amy are still in Cleveland, Tennessee, where Amy's parents live. So please keep all of them in your prayers. Um, I'm not sure exactly when Scott and Evan are coming back. Uh, the last I heard was tomorrow. But we'll try and keep you updated on that as, as well. Also would ask that you continue to keep the family of Vicki Proctor in your prayers, whose memorial service was yesterday, and I would like to say personally, and also uh, for the family, they were very touched by the number of people who were present for Vicki's um, service. Vicki was not a person who ever sought the spotlight and was often perhaps, I won't say overlooked, but uh, kind of in the background. But uh, you, you could tell yesterday the number of people who have been touched by her and, and her sweet spirit. So keep her family in your prayers. Continue to pray for Shelly Hutchinson, Joy Rush, Herman Lysi's brother, and I apologize, I know his name, but I cannot pull it up, but is having some health challenges and would uh, ask that you pray for Herman's brother. Also, Jean's, where did Jean go? Jean's not here today. No, Jean Jackson, I'm sorry. Her friend, Olin, um, Olivia, that we've been at, for prayer, and I haven't gotten an update whether she's still in the hospital or not, but uh, continue to keep her, uh, Olivia, in your prayers as well. Also, um, prayer has been requested for 12-year-old Chloe. She's uh, a young girl who's been to VBS with her siblings here for a number of years, and we just keep her in in your in your prayers are there any additional prayer requests that did not make it to me and you would like to to mention as we join together would i'm sure all of you have been hearing the news of the tensions in eastern europe and so I would ask that we continue to pray for our, our elected leaders and diplomats who are working to de-escalate that situation. Pray that, uh, that an armed conflict does not um, come out of that situation and that, that the people in charge will. As a famous musician once said, give peace a chance. Also, we continue to pray for those affected by COVID-19. It's been heartening that some of the numbers in terms of cases and deaths have been slowly declining, and we pray that that trend will continue. But healthcare workers and hospitals are still pretty close to being overwhelmed, and so we pray for those, those workers who are at risk of trying to help those who are sick. Continue to pray for our first responders, uh, police and fire and EMS. Continue to pray for our military, and especially in light of the fact that U.S. troops are being deployed to uh, Eastern Europe uh, as we gather here this morning. would ask that you continue to, to pray for our church. We've had, I've been part of a couple of discussions here about
about the upcoming general conference where decisions will be made about the future structure of the United Methodist Church. And there are questions. Um, and would encourage you, if you have an interest in kind of learning more about this complicated process, um, if you go to the United Methodist Church's website, uh, umc.org, or if you go to United Methodist News Service, which is umnews.org, and they are providing information about that. Um, there were several constitutional questions that were being um, reviewed by the church's judicial council, and they have last week issued six rulings related to the what might happen at general conference, let's put it that way. And so it, there, there are places out there, and if you have questions, you, you can certainly email Scott or me, we'd be glad to, to give you our perspective on it. But it's, uh, but we want to pray for our church. We want to pray for our church here, that we continue to grow in faith and in being Jesus' hands and feet in, in this community. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of wonder, heart of creation, we are blessed when we feast on your word. That word which embraces us, that word which teaches us, that word which transfigures us, that word which grounds us. Give us your word this and every day. Jesus Christ, heart of God's children, we are blessed when we have your compassion, that heart for the poor, for the hungry, for those who weep, for those left out, for the lost, and the least and the lonely. Give us your heart this and every day. Holy delight, grace's heartbeat, we bear fruit when we overflow with your spirit, that spirit of generosity, that spirit of pouring ourselves out in service, that spirit of bearing another's burden, that spirit when we put our faith in action. Give us your spirit, this and every day. As we remember the blessings you have brought to us, may our hearts beat as one with your heart, even as we pray as Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue in our worship. Uh, the next song, Strength of My Life, uh, we introduced several months ago. And I was thinking about Paul's words, uh, writing in 2 Corinthians, um, when he was struggling with some sort of fleshly malady. And he had prayed for deliverance, and the Lord had not yet given it. And uh, Christ says to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says in response, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong.
join with me in prayer. Father, you are indeed the strength of our life. You are the power source for Christian living. Lord, we pray that you would so work in our hearts today through the ministry of your word, that you would be about the work of transforming us more and more into the image of our Savior. Grant us hearts of obedience. Grant us hearts that seek to know you through the eternal word that you have given us. We pray in Christ's name. waiting to come up on the platform like with Ryan and I were over there you notice that Ryan came up on this side which is about you know and the old guys like me have to come here but if I come up on that side my, my knees let me know that that was a poor choice so, remember when you are in school and come into class and the teacher says we're going to have a pop quiz Remember that feeling? Yeah. So here's today's pop quiz. I'm not preaching on Matthew, and it's in the bulletin. I thought about that, but Scott was going to preach on that, and I'm sure I wouldn't say exactly what Scott was going to say, and so I'm going to let him save that sermon for when he needs it down the road somewhere. I'm preaching from the book of James, and you know, the disciples acquired nicknames early on in, in church in history. Thomas became Doubting Thomas. Peter became the Rock. Well, James had a nickname too. And I wonder if anybody knows what James's nickname is. Ding dong, ding dong. It was, or it is, camel means. Old camel knees, because he spent so much time kneeling in prayer that his knees became disfigured, enlarged, and knobby like a camel. So the tradition goes. All right. You'll do better on your next pop quiz. Book of James, you can tell that I did not put my bookmark in the right place, but the first chapter of the book of James beginning with verse 17. Every generous act of giving, with every perfect gift, is from above, coming down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. 
If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep one unstained by the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And we give God thanks for it. You join me in prayer. O oh Lord, we pray. Speak in this place, in the calming of our minds and in the longing of our hearts, by the words of my lips and in the thoughts that we form. Speak, O oh Lord, for your servants listen. Amen. The Epistle of James. Little known, perhaps, greatly neglected. James tends to major in the obvious. The great Protestant reformer, Martin Luther, called James an epistle of straw. About as much help as a bundle of straw for struggling Christians. And I'm going to challenge that assessment and suggest to you today that James is so much more than straw. Why did Luther think that James was so insignificant? Perhaps Luther did not like that Christ is not emphasized in the book of James to the extent Luther would like. The words Jesus Christ are mentioned only twice in the book of James. There's not one mention of the cross. There's not one mention of Jesus dying on the cross to pay for our sins. There is not one mention of baptism, that he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And there's not one mention of the word grace and what grace means. Luther didn't like that. What else contributed to Luther's immense disregard for the book? Maybe it was because of his apparent emphasis on doing good works. Luther, like the Apostle Paul, emphasized that we are put right with God and justified through God's grace, through faith in Christ and not by any works that we do. James, on the other hand, says that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. James emphasized works. You need to do good works to be a Christian. Well, in spite of Luther's criticism, I have to admit I kind of like the book of James. And I've discovered over the years that many of you sitting in the congregation like James too. The book of James is practical. James is down to earth, real life, practical implications of being a Christian. I Acknowledge that James does not have the theological and spiritual depth of, say, the book of Romans. There is no Christ, no justification, no grace, no atonement, no Christ died for our sins, no forgiveness, and no grace. So where, where is the gospel in James? I think there we will see a relevance in the book of James for our personal lives and for the life of our congregation. A Christian cannot separate faith from works of charitable love, what Wesley called works of mercy. Just as you can't separate your head from your body, your head from your heart, without dying, James would 
suggests that you cannot separate faith from works of charitable love. John Wesley, founder of Methodism, was not an original theologian like Luther or John Calvin, but he was very practical, very organized, very methodical in his faith. So he liked to say that we are saved by both faith and good works. And while not the main point today is any book in the New Testament could be called Methodist in spirit, I think James would be on the short list. I would rather see a sermon than hear one. I'm sure you've heard this old saying many times. Maybe you've even said it yourself. Of course, if you said it, why would you need to get up and get dressed and come to church to hear a preacher say it? It's, it's a little trite, well-known saying, even though it's also true. You've heard me say before that your lives are the only Bible some people will ever read. Just because the truth is well-known, does that make it any less true? Well, James says directly, be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. James is full of these pithy little sayings which everybody already knows. Every good gift is from heaven. Be swift to listen, slow to speak. Lay aside filthiness and wickedness. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. You know, it sort of sounds like my mother. And, um, you know, that, maybe that you know, you want to come to church to have someone sound like your mother telling you what you should do. James is almost too obvious, and maybe that's why it tends to be neglected. I mean, as, as a preacher, give me a text that is strange, unfamiliar, tough to comprehend, in need of homiletical elucidation. That's what we like. If the whole Bible were like the letter of James, you really wouldn't need preachers. For who needs a preacher merely to remind you of what you already know? Yet, in a way, I would contend that is precisely what we need. That's why at funerals and weddings, the scriptures and the liturgy are the same Eventually, you become to know them almost by heart. The prayers of confession and the prayer of great thanksgiving, holy communion. You do it enough and it becomes kind of second nature. To be reminded of what we already know. Verse 22 is kind of the linchpin. Be doers of the word, not merely hearers. But it is in the next two verses that James remind us of why we need to be reminded. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in the mirror, or they look at themselves and on going away forget what they were like. And that's one reason we need to attend to this saying form of the letter of James. We already know this. But knowing this, being doers and not hearers, is not the problem. Doing is the problem. We live in, uh, used to say, we live in the information age, and I would argue it's probably the information overload age now. If you're not connected to the internet, on your phone, home, play games, watch videos, watch movies, take all that stuff. Yet here in James, we're told that hearing, knowing what to do, is not as important as actually doing what you know to do. James never asked his hearers, well, do you agree with me? Does this sound reasonable to you? Do you get my drift? 
Jesus wanted more than agreement. Most of the time they call Jesus teacher, but he seems to be about more than mere inculcation of knowledge, of gathering knowledge and having a repository that you can tap into. What Jesus said was follow me. He was after discipleship, not just an intellectual agreement. He wants a relationship. There's a story about St. Francis of Assisi that he was praying in an ancient church that was badly in need of repair. He heard a voice from the crucifix which was over the altar and which said, Francis, go and repair my church, which you see falling into ruin. So Francis went and got his tool chest, but he soon realized that the voice of God was referring to something else. The voice of God again said, not the bricks, Francis, the people are in need of repair. And as we know, Francis went on to take care of orphans and widows. The voice of God still speaks from above the altar today. Go and repair my church, which is falling into ruins. And God is not talking about bricks and mortar. Sometimes I've heard people say at church on Sunday morning, well, you know, I kind of I kind of think of the church as a filling station. I come here empty, and during the service I get filled so that I can make it through the week. That's not the worst analogy, but it's passive. It's receptive. It's not active. It's not. It makes the church into a place where we come and we sit back and say, okay, preacher, okay, choir and musicians, do it to me. Fill me up. As if we're performing for you. But here's something else that you also already know. You aren't the audience. God is our audience. No, the test of good worship, the mark of a good church, is not only what we do here during this hour of worship. It's what we do outside those doors for the rest of the week. Yet, here as elsewhere, after all is said and done, more is said than done. The world is quite right in judging the truth of the gospel on the basis of the sort of lives the gospel is able to produce. Do we look like, do we act like the children of God whom we pray so joyfully on Sunday morning? Have our songs and prayers changed us, made us into that which we profess? Are we patient, kind? compassionate, slow to anger, merciful, joyful, and hopeful. That's the test, says James. And yet we already know that. We know that any sermon which is seen in deeds of love and justice is more effective than one which is only spoken and heard. How many people have been turned off with the church, have gone away from Jesus, because they have been hurt or scandalized by the actions or lack of action on the part of those who profess to follow Jesus. And so now the sermon is coming to an end. The test for the sermon, the mark of whether or not this was a good sermon, a good service, is about to come upon us. You already agree with the sermon because you already know what has been said. You already understand the biblical text. Agreement 
and understanding is not the problem. The issue is now before us. And so now for the final question. What will we do with that which we have said, prayed, sung, and heard? Pastor, that was a wonderful sermon, said the parishioner at the door after the service. Thank you, said the preacher, but that remains to be seen. Will you join me in prayer? Grant, dear Lord, that what we hear with our ears, we may believe in our hearts, and what we believe in our hearts, we may practice in our lives. Amen. Let's just stand together for our closing song, Glorious Day. Such a wonderful song, and uh, there are a lot of glorious days in the Christian life, but this particular song is about the, the day that we embrace Christ as he is offered to us in the gospel. That is indeed the most glorious day.
Tomorrow's Valentine's Day. Do have that right? Oh, yes. <laughs> Denise will be upset if I don't. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I wanted to add a footnote to what I said earlier. For Valentine, you know, we had all those little hearts and things on bulletin boards around, and I got a text, and I was, that's what I was looking for on my phone, which and I couldn't find it. But I think, Ryan, you may remember 120, 130 Valentines and to kids uh, here and around to uh, folks at the uh, English as a Second Language. So, uh, close to home example of faith in action and uh, doing what we already know we should be doing. So, grounded in God's love, we are sent out to share abundance with those who have so little. Blessed with Jesus' hope, we go forth to fill the emptiness of those longing for justice. Blessed with the Spirit's delight, we dance into the world to be generous friends to those for whom love has been a stranger. And so, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Go in peace. Amen. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I need a shelter, I was an orphan, no you call me a citizen of heaven.